It's okay. I'm easy. All right. Good morning, everyone. I think we may have more people on YouTube than in person because of the snow. So hello to everyone who's on YouTube today. Let's begin uh, with the rite of uh, thanksgiving at the font. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us give thanks together for the gift of baptism. We praise you, God, for water the Hackensack River, Lake Hoptakong, Hohokus Brook, the rain that nourishes animals and plants, the water for drinking and bathing. We praise you, O God, for water. We praise you, O God, for water. We praise you, O God, for our water stories, the flood that cleansed the earth, the, sea, the river that healed our afflictions. We praise you, O God, for water. We praise you, O God, for water. We remember the waters of Jesus, baptized in the Jordan River, calming the Sea of Galilee, drinking from Jacob's well, and washing the disciples' feet. We praise you, O God, for water. We praise you, O God, for water. O God, you are ocean sustaining this earth. You are the river saving us from death and the fountain granting us health and wholeness. We praise you, O God, today, tomorrow, forever. Amen and amen. Amen and amen.
of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Holy God, creator of light and giver of goodness, your voice moves over the waters. Immerse us in your grace and transform us by your spirit that we may follow after your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. All right. I'm glad you all sit up front because on Saturdays, people, everyone sits in the back pew and I got to move way up to talk to people. So we're doing uh, bits of the small catechism and we're doing the Lord's Prayer. This is the second petition of the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come. What is this? Luther says. God's kingdom comes on its own without our prayer, but we ask in this prayer that it may also come to us. And how does it come about? Whenever our Heavenly Father gives us the Holy Spirit, so that through the Spirit's grace we may believe God's word and live godly lives here in time and hereafter in eternity. The point I want you to pick up here, God's kingdom comes on its own without our prayer, but we ask in this prayer that it also may come to us. So, does God need us or our prayers to bring in the kingdom of God? No, right? It can be a really nice thing to be needed. I was trying to find something in my office. A few years ago, I really needed these. Does anybody want to guess what they are? 
These are old printer cartridges. Four years ago, I needed a bunch of these, right? But what happened? Well, we got a new printer, and now I don't need these, so they just sit in the drawer, right? If you're needed, eventually, you might not be needed anymore, right? As humans, we often like to be needed. We like to have people be like, if it wasn't for you, this would all fall apart. Luther's whole idea here is that God doesn't need you. God loves you. And the difference is that someday you might not be needed anymore, but will you ever not be loved by God? No. You're not needed, you're loved, right? That's the whole idea. All right, so we're going to do, I think it's Isaiah. Oh, no, it's Genesis today. I gave you a different translation, so see if you can find some differences this week. The first reading is from Genesis chapter 1. When God began to create heaven and earth, and the earth then was water and waste and darkness over the deep, and God's breath hovered over the waters, God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And it was evening, and it was morning, first day, the word of the Lord. Drive to the Lord, you gods, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory to God's name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters, the Lord of God glory. The Lord is upon the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is a powerful voice. The voice of the Lord is a voice of splendor. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedar trees. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. The Lord makes Lebanon skip like a calf, and Mount Hermon like a young wild ox. The second reading is from Acts chapter 19. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the interior regions and came to Ephesus, where he found some disciples. He said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? They replied, no, we had not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And then he said, into what then were you baptized? They answered, into John's baptism. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Altogether, there were about 12 of them. The word of the Lord. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. 
And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Then in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove up upon him. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So if I were allowed, this is a hypothetical, don't go call the bishop after worship today. If I were allowed to make a change to the Nicene Creed, I wouldn't go after the God, the Father, gender stuff. I wouldn't go for the Christology, Jesus' light from light stuff. I would go for the third article of the Creed, and I would go for this line. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. I would take that line, I would delete for the forgiveness of sins. And I would take it out, not because it's wrong, but because it draws our attention away from what's really important and what's at the heart of the readings that we heard today. We, we meaning American Christians, tend to have a very individualistic view of sin. Sin is something that I do. Maybe it's something I don't do, but in any event, it's definitely about me. It's about my decisions, my actions, my words. The problem in my life is sometimes I make the wrong choice, and the solution is I need to be forgiven. So I come to church, I get forgiven, I go out and I try it again next week. Because we have an individual view of sin, we often have an individual view of baptism. In our tradition, confession and forgiveness flows out of baptism, which can make it seem like we remember baptism because you want to wipe the slate clean once a week and start over. Now, there's some truth in this. It's not totally wrong. But if the only way we think about baptism is as forgiving individual sins, it raises some questions for us. For one, what about systemic sins? When we think about racism, prejudice, destruction of the environment, hunger, and poverty, these are caused by more than just bad choices that we made since last Sunday. And if baptism is all about being forgiven for the mistakes we make, then why do we baptize infants? Infants don't do anything wrong. In fact, they don't do much of anything except eat, sleep, and cry. So what do they need to be baptized for? And thinking about baptism this way also raises some questions about the stories in the Bible, too. Think about today's gospel reading we just heard. If Jesus is free from sin, his life is totally open to God's love and neighbor, why does Jesus have to be baptized? In Mark's gospel, this is the very first thing that happens in the gospel. So Jesus hasn't just not done anything wrong. He literally has not done anything up to this point in the story. So why does he need to be baptized? Well, these are good questions, not because they're difficult, but they help us think about sort of first principles for us to return to the way the authors of scripture talk about baptism. And when we do that, you see our little individual sin focus is actually a much bigger hole for the way they talk about baptism. And we heard a good example of the larger hole in today's reading from the book of Acts that Diane read. In the story, St. Paul encounters a group of disciples and Paul asks, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? And they reply, I think it helps to read humor in the response they give. They say, no, we didn't even know there is a Holy Spirit. So there's some miscommunication going on here. And the next line helps us understand what the disconnect is. Then Paul said, so into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. So apparently, when John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, told people to repent and be baptized, these people said, for sure, we accept the invitation, we're going to go be baptized by John, 
we've repented, we've reoriented our lives in some ways. So far, so good. But notice Paul doesn't ask who baptized you. He asks them, into what were you baptized? In other words, it's about where you're headed. What's your goal? What's your direction, your end? And the answer is, they don't really know. They've turned their lives away from what they used to be, but they haven't really turned them toward anything. We use different words for this feeling. We call it aimlessness, languishness, languishing, puttering around, just sort of killing time. This past fall, one report found that three in five young adults, 18 to 25, say their lives have no real meaning or purpose. They have no direction. And maybe you feel the same way too. This is the kind of situation Paul finds this group of disciples in. And so Paul invites them to be baptized in the name of Jesus. That means sharing in Jesus' mission, caring for the downtrodden, working for reconciliation, proclaiming the fullness of God's mercy has come near in Jesus. So instead of just killing time or languishing or puttering around waiting for life to happen, they have purpose, they have direction, and they have mission. The word that we use for this in our tradition is vocation, the ways that we love God by serving our neighbors. And Luke suggests this is not something that we find for ourselves, but something that's given to us in our baptisms. That puts baptism in a different light than the old, it's about forgiving my sins way of thinking. If baptism is all about forgiving my sins, it's only about fixing what happened in the past. If it's about wiping the slate clean periodically, it can never really free myself from my own worst tendencies. And if it's about my individual choices, it doesn't really connect me with other people. But if Luke is right and baptism is about purpose, then it's also about the future. If it's about mission, then it draws people into new relationships. And if it's about discipleship, then it changes us and forms us into Jesus's way of life. And this is exactly what we do every week when we remember our baptisms. We participate in Jesus's mission. And this help clears up all those questions we had. Why was Jesus baptized? It's to begin his public ministry of announcing that the kingdom of God, God's ways of love and peace are here. What does baptism have to do with systemic sin? Well, it unites us to the ministry of Jesus that changes not just hearts and minds, but cultures and values and structures. And why do we baptize infants? To include them in God's mission, so that as they grow up, they know that their lives are never without purpose and direction and meaning. This is exactly why, whenever we do basically any sort of milestone in the congregation, we always use affirmation of baptism. Confirmation is just affirmation of baptism. Welcoming new members is just affirmation of baptism. We do that to remember that it's Jesus' mission, Jesus' purpose that holds us together. So maybe, hypothetically, if I were going to make edits to the Nicene Creed, I wouldn't delete the part about baptism being for the forgiveness of sins, but I would add something to it. Something like this. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sin and to unite us in God's mission. Our baptisms don't mean we never grieve or experience loss, but they do mean we never live without purpose or direction in life. We don't know what tomorrow will bring, but we know what direction we're headed, and we know who's leading us there along the way. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
found in water, baptized and set free. Let's join together with the church around the world as we confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. Will we believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church? We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. I invite the assembly to sit or kneel for the reading of today's prayers. As we celebrate Christ embodied in human form, we pray for God's blessing on the church, the world, and all of creation. Inspire wisdom and spirit of proclamation in your church, God of forgiveness. Uplift leaders to share the truth of your word in community. Encourage us to live in the promises of baptism, working for justice and peace in all the world. God of grace, Renew your creation, God of thunder and mighty waters. Restore the rivers in which your children are baptized. May fields flourish and grow. Summon the stewards and caretakers of the land to cherish your good works. God of grace. Give strength to your leaders, God, who is present in every country and community. Raise up leaders committed to equity and healing. Grant them the discernment and compassion as they lead in love. We pray especially this week for the people of Bahrain, Kuwait, Oman, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Yemen, God of grace. Protect and cherish the most vulnerable among us, God of strength. Accompany those separated from families, or hurting from broken relationships. Shelter our unhoused neighbors and any experiencing poverty. Protect those incarcerated in prisons and detention centers. Care for the sick and suffering. If you have additional petitions, I invite you to offer them out loud or in your hearts. My brother. God of grace. Encourage this congregation, God who calls and sends disciples. Guide us in accompanying, learning from, and serving our neighbors on the margins, following the example of Jesus, God of grace. Receive our prayer. Trusting the assurance of the Holy Spirit, we remember all who have died and rest in God's care. Give hope to those who grieve, even as we rest in your eternal promise of resurrection. God of grace. Receive our prayer. Knowing the Holy Spirit intercedes for us, we offer these prayers and the silent prayers of our hearts in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And may the peace of the Lord be with you always and also with you.
Just to make this easier today, I'm going to invite you to receive communion at the altar rail. So you're invited after the Lord's Prayer to come up, and I'll have bread, I'll have wine and juice, and then I'll have empty. So I'll invite you to come up. Let us pray. Blessed are you, God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have these gifts to share. Accept and use our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Blessed be God forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. By the leading of a star, he was shown forth to all nations. In the waters of the Jordan, you proclaimed him your beloved son. And in the miracle of water turned into wine, he revealed your glory. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, We praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the Holy God, you are love beyond measure, grace beyond cause, life beyond death. Long ago, you spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways. The calling of Abraham and Sarah, the giving of the law at Sinai, the witness of the prophets. And now in the fullness of time, you have spoken to us and your son. Jesus, our brother, he shares our lot. Christ, your son, he reflects your glory. For in him all things were created, and through him all creation is brought to its fullness. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after the supper, after the supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. In the beginning, your spirit moved over the face of the deep, calling creation into being. So send now your spirit on these gifts of bread and wine and those who share them, that we too might become a new creation in Christ our Lord. For all glory and praise are due to you, O God, uncreated goodness, unending love, unceasing light, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. And gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
I'm going to commune you first, just so you have time. Unju, this is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. Let us pray. Lord of all time and eternity, you open the heavens and reveal Jesus as your Son. By the power of your Spirit, complete the heavenly work of rebirth through the waters of the new creation, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Anyone have any announcements or anything? Thank you all for being here. I thought it might just be me and Unju this morning, so this was nice. Yes, Matt. Yes. Oh, good. That's great. Uh, the closing hymn today, this it's was a little difficult to format, so it goes on to the last page. So you'll just turn the page when you get to the bottom, and we'll sing this through twice. I think this should be familiar to you, I'm guessing. I invite you to receive the blessing. Oh, yes. Uh, it's not required yet, but it's a good idea. So the annual meeting of the congregation is January 28th. Uh, everyone is invited to attend. I ask to be a voting member, you're supposed to be a formal member of the church, which just means filling out a piece of paper and going in the membership rolls. But thank you, Matt, that's great. So that's 1045 Sunday, January 28th. Everyone on YouTube as well, please make a note of that. It was in the newsletter which is the formal written notice. So thank you, Matt. I invite you to receive the blessing. 
May God, who in Christ Jesus gives us the spring of water welling up to eternal life, perfect in you the image of the Trinity's glory, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, join in God's mission. Thanks be to God.